Hey everybody, welcome. Um, I'm Romy Hill and this is a YouTube live all about my new Swoop Softly cardigan. And um, I've been kind of running around <laughs> all morning so I'm a little bit like distracted. And I have my sock blockers are in the picture there. But now they're gone. So welcome. I'm really glad that you could be here. Um, I love seeing you all in the comments. So um, please ask questions. Um, do, you know, if you have anything that you are interested in particularly in hearing about, um, let me know. And I will be watching. So I'm I have this all set up on my iPad. So I'm kind of looking over here. Um, I see there's a question here. Um, okay, so let's see. So I have, I know there have been tons of questions about yarn substitutions. Um, so that's the first thing I'm gonna talk about. And here's my, here's my cardigan. So to, um, to follow along on here like i'm going to be like kind of talking through the pattern and to follow along then you will need the swoop softly pattern and that can be found on ravelry or designs by romy.com and um, a verb for keeping warm has yarn bundles um, and they include um, everything that you need to make it so the bundle that they have on their site is in these colors, in my colorway, but they're super accommodating and wonderful. And so if you want a different color, they will help you choose something perfect for you. So um, don't fear, like if this is not your thing, totally get it. Um, just give them a call and they can help you find the right thing. So this is a, my sample is a size 40. And it used one skein of light fingering weight um, for, for keeping warm. It's called um, Even Tinier Annapurna and one skein of mohair silk lace weight. Um, their base is called Frond. So one skein of each for the size 40. Um, and the pictures that you see of Christine and me wearing it, I am not sure Christine's best size. I'm a 39. So um, like, I have seen this on the sample on people from like a size 32 bust to a size, I would say 54, and it looked really nice. So I think because it's it's really meant to be open in the front, and so um, it just hangs really nicely, and um, it looks really it looks really good. It's got like a slight a line flare in the back because of the short row wedges, so um, that really helps kind of make that that sample size that I did um, look good on even more people. So hi everybody, hi Judy, Heather, Jeannie, Terry, Rachel, Elise. Um, Joy, Devora, so nice to see you all here. So thanks for joining me. Um, okay, so here it is. You can kind of see like when I hold it up here, how light and airy it is. And that is because of that um, mohair lace weight in there. And this is, it's knit on a size US 5 needle. So um, it's very lightweight and ethereal. So that is the biggest thing. Hi, Terry. Um, that is the biggest thing that you need to think about when you're substituting yarn. So, uh, mohair is a very light fiber and because of how light this is, like if you picked it up, um, if you came and saw it out of her for keeping warm during the, the Bay Area yarn crawl and you pick this up, it is incredibly light. So when you look at the back here and you see like the these um, short row wedge areas here, that's what keeps those um, open like that. And that's what keeps it 
from kind of hanging down a lot. So I just want to show you, I, I swatched so much for this. Um, like I, I probably spent more time swatching than I did actually knitting <laughs> the sweater. So I did actually swatch with two um, colors of even tinier Annapurna, and that is a light fingering weight. So you can kind of see um, here, it's the same size needle, but it's not really as open. Um, it's a little bit springier. So that is something to keep in mind when you want to substitute. Um, lace weight mohair silk keeps the block really, really, really well. And it's also super light. So even though um, the yardage on this like is kind of, it's kind of mm, similar-ish, I suppose. Um, this hangs down much longer because it's heavier. And also because um, it just is a little bit squishier. So it kind of scrunches back together. So let me see, um, mohair. So Elise, I've had that question a lot. Um, people who are allergic to mohair. So let's see. The big thing here is, um, here's my, here's my other little swatchy thing here. Um, because mohair is so light, and because of the way that it, it has that halo and it's sort of like a cloud, I still have my swatch kind of on me. Um, if you substitute something that doesn't have a halo that's not that light, you can, I mean, obviously you can substitute anything that you want, but it won't have the same effect and it will hang lower. So. It's not gonna be um, quite the look that you see with this. You can definitely, I mean, you can substitute for sure. The fabric is going to be really open because if you don't have that halo there, it's not going to fill in like this. So um, I'm just going to switch over here to my hand so you can take a look at the fabric really close and then, and you'll see what I mean. So, um, okay, so here is, here's the fabric up really close. So you can see there's that, um, there's that lace weight here. Here is the lace weight mohair silk. And then you have the um, light fingering weight here. So when you look super close at it, you can see it's a very loose fabric. So just take that into consideration. Um, you probably, you'll definitely want to swatch whatever you want to substitute for it if you are not using a halo and see where you like the fabric. I think that it would be fairly easy to modify this pattern and um, if you get a fabric and it's a smaller gauge than um, what is called for in the pattern, I think it would be fairly easy to just work a larger size that could give you closer to your measurements. And then you'd be able to sort of adjust as you go along for it. So, um, and yes, Joy said just silk would be a lot heavier. Yes, it would. So um, I, I don't know if you're able to use um, like a wool or something, um, but there are wools that are fluffy. Like if you use um, like a wool that is woolen spun. So that, that's the type of spin that gives you that really fuzzy light type of wool. I think you could do that. And um, I think you could substitute that across pretty well because it's like super light and fluffy and airy. So um, like maybe a Shetland jumper weight type 
of yarn might um, might work if you use two colors. Um, let's see. And then Mary, yes, Kid Silk Haze is basically the same as Frond. So um, all those mohair silk lace weights, you can substitute pretty much. So I, I actually just, I was testing some more things out when I went back to, um, to write up the pattern and, um, and kind of like refine things. Um, so I, I went stash diving and I found this mohair silk from Bisha Bouche and then also their Lipiti um, lamb's wool. So I just started one in those yarns and it's it seems to be pretty um, successful so far. So yeah, any, any one of those silk mohair yarns that you see the lace weight. So um, maybe transition back again. So another thing that you can consider if you can deal with a little bit of fuzz is a yarn called Wild Bloom. And that's from a verb for keeping warm and it has cashmere um, and some alpaca and yak I think is the blend. And it's um, really, it's very soft and um, it's very, very light. So it has only about 22 yards of less than the mohair silk. And the other possibility is um, there's a yarn called Little Kumo from La Bien Aime, And that one has also like, I think 22 yards less than the uh, frond, the silk mohair. So that is um, a lace weight Surrey alpaca with silk. There are probably others too, but those are just the two like off the top of my head that you could use instead of mohair and get pretty much the same, um, the same like fluffy light feeling to the sweater. So there is another, there's a uh, soft current is a yarn from Verb. That is a Surrey alpaca as well. And um, the yardage is significantly less. It's like um, 100 yards less, I think. And alpaca tends to be heavier already. So um, you certainly can use it, but you do need to swatch and make sure that it's not going to like weigh your sweater down. And let's see. Um, just looking at the comments here. So, Devora, yes, I think Anzilla Cloud would be totally fine. Um, yes, and Sue, um, Bisha Bush, Le Petit Silk and Mohair for sure. Um, I've been using that in my one that I, I went stash diving for. So I, I uh, this is my through the gate gently color and I had some leftover. <laughs> so, so I was like, hmm. I think I'll make another and um, just make sure that like the short row is, the short row section is perfect. So yeah, absolutely. Any one of those silk mohairs, those will all work. Um, and so um, Terry said that your her frond looks really orange. Yes, so it does look really orange. Um, I'm just going to show you kind of super up close again because the only part you're going to see um there are like there are orange speckles in the frond so you can see and here it is really orangey however because you're using it with um stripes of the eta the even tinier annapurna it's not going to look like an orange sweater. So it's incredible the difference that it makes when you stripe it together. Um, it is peachy with orange speckles in there. So um, yeah, it, it doesn't really read as orange when you wear it. So I, I think I've had people say that the sweater looks beige or peach or uh, someone said it looked pink to them. And that's because you're striping them. 
So um, let me see other questions. Um, so, oh, so Kim says Jimmy Beans has a line called Yarn Citizen and a yarn called Trinity Cashmere that has silk alpaca and cashmere. That sounds really pretty. So um, it sounds beautiful. I am not familiar with that yarn in particular, but um, if the yardage is right, then go for it. And then let's see. Um, okay, so Rachel asks, what about substituting a different yarn for the main color? You mentioned that the back yoke adding strength to the construction, would a heavy lace weight merino silk work or is that too thin? No, no, that would be totally, that would be totally fine. So what Rachel is talking about um, is up, the yoke part here is only um, the even tinier Annapurna. So this sweater was designed particularly to take advantage of the yardage, the put up. And so, um it's nice because i think this is a little bit stronger across here without the super fine lace weight but um but if you want to sub a heavy lace weight for that light fingering that is really close it's it's very close in yardage and um it, i think it would work really well and then let's see oh thank you Rachel said my nails were fabulous. Yay, thank you. I did peachy just for the sweater. <laughs> um, okay, so let's kind of take a little bit of a look here. Okay, so I'm just gonna go kind of through the pattern and um, show you where things are on my sweater. And then I'm going to show you um, a bunch of the techniques in here and especially the cast on. So I have this organized um, because it's a little bit of a different construction. So I have this organized and uh, I got very picky about the organization, I guess. <laughs> so the back part has these wedges in here, the short row wedges. And this, it was kind of, uh, it was designed with my swoop shawl in mind. And so the short row wedges echo um, the swoop, but it's a little bit different because I wanted, I didn't want to increase or decrease any of the stitches in this area. So on swoop, I'm increasing every time there's a short row section, there's an increase. But on this, um, the short row wedges are written so there isn't an increase in stitches across there. So you're going to be casting on right here. And these short row sections are worked along with the left back of the sweater. So when you first start this, it's going to look really like a tiny little sweater to you. And you might be really nervous, but I just want to show you um, how how actually how big it looks. Um, this is the one, this is the size 40 that I'm making again. And it looks pretty tiny. Like it looks like it would be too small, but it's, it's actually not. It's just not blocked out yet. And it's really fluffy. So it really needs that blocking in order to kind of arrive at where it's gonna be. So don't worry, it, it will be okay, I promise. Okay, and then, um, so we're gonna work across all four of the short row wedges. And the wedges are shown in this little area here um, in the, that kind of tinted yellow area. So they're, uh, they're mirrored. So the first two here, they're going to be a mirror of the second two and they're coming like the shaping is coming out like that so I'll take a look here and I will show you what that looks like okay so when you're looking at this 
you can see how they come away from each other here. So uh, they're mirrored and um, they're written a little bit differently because of the, the different way that um, I was, I had to keep the stitches uniform um, and not add or subtract stitches. So if you've taken a look at the short row sections, you'll know what I mean. And we will go through those as well. Okay. Alrighty. So you're going to work all the way across here. And the, the sweater is put together with a modified three needle bind off. And that is, that's what the, uh, that looks like right here. So I leave live stitches wherever possible. And then the live stitches are worked later on. So um, once you finish that left side, you're gonna see that you want it to lead those live stitches on waste yarn. And then you're gonna have stitches picked up and everything is attached. So it, I think it makes a really pretty seam and it lays super flat and it's, it also provides extra strength for the sweater. So once that is finished, um, this was a, this is the Judy's magic cast on by the way. And so you have live loops going both ways. And one of those is going to just kind of hang out on the, on your needle. And then when you pick it up, you're going to knit the other way here. So once you're finished with that, I'll show you what it looks like when you're, when you hold the, um, the stitches on waste yarn, that's, that's all it is. Just stick those stitches on the waste yarn and hold them for later instead of binding off and doing a seam later. So um, across the top here, there's shoulder shaping and the shoulder shaping falls below the yoke. So um, I like to mark them with a pin every time I do a decrease across here for the shoulder. And that is just so I can go back and just make sure that I did actually get all of my decreases in there. Um, when I get distracted, I will tend to like, you know, forget a sh like a shaping row or something like this. This is, and it's really handy just to go back and have those pins across there and I can just count exactly um, where I am. So all the pins, all the pins are great. <laughs> okay, so once the back is finished, then you're gonna go on to the right front and that has another Judy's Magic cast on across here. So um, I use two size five, a US five long, needles. And um, I'll, I'll show you that later. I'm going to do a short row section to show you. I'll show you that what, what it looks like later. I'll also sh show you the cast on. Um, and here's why. So Judy's has, um, is, a, is a really cool cast on. It leaves you with a row of purl stitches. So one purl ridge. And when you turn it over, uh, when you cast on, you don't see it, but when you turn it over, you see it. And it's a perfect way to start garter stitch. And because you're using two needles of the same size, the, that cast on is so invisible. Like you don't have to go back and adjust it or anything. Um, it's It comes out perfect and adjustable. So these two, both the right and the left fronts are both cast on. They both have um, Judy's because as a last part, you're going to work uh, all the way around here and you're going to um, put an edging on. So let me show you what that looks like. So you're just going to be working that edging here, this is the edging, and you can't even tell. Um, you can't even tell where the cast on is at all here because Judy's is just like amazing. Just it disappears, <laughs> becomes completely invisible. 
Okay, so these are worked basically the same way, except that um, the sleeve is actually larger in the front because the yoke part is only really visible in the back. So um, here's, here's the front and then here's the, the back part here. So this is this really follows your shoulder line and um, it's not really visible in the front. So once you have done your right front and your left front, then you're gonna go over to the yoke. Um, so you do have to pick up stitches. However, it's super easy to see how many you have to pick up because garter stitch is square, so you're just picking one up at the top of each stripe. So each stripe is going to have its own little um, stitch picked up across here. And I used a method where you just pick up from the garter bump at the edge. So there's no selvage stitch. So this, if you were to like kind of um, feel this in your hand, you, you wouldn't feel um, any type of seam here. So all you would, you'd just feel, it just feels like um, plain knitting. You wouldn't be able to tell really where the stitches are picked up. So I added a little eyelet row across here and up at the top here, um, the neckline here is shaped with uh, German short rows. And so the whole yoke is knit. Everything is worked on the yoke. And then you're going to pick up stitches from one front at a time. So just like the back, you're gonna be picking up stitches across the top of each of these um, stripes. So one stitch per stripe and then there's another modified three needle bind off here. It's a very flat bind off. It um, looks really pretty. And so this is mirrored here um, to go out from the neck edge. On one side, that means that you're not going to be using, you're going to be um, not starting from the side where your live yarn is. So, and that is because these are mirrored. So these, they both go out from the edge across here. And uh, my amazing test knitter, Vivian, has notes about it as well. So she actually used a tail from, um, from her ball of yarn to pick up the stitches. And then, and then she, um, she used the rest of her main yarn to bind off with the modified three needle bind off. So once that's done, you're going to, um, so that was, that's basically the, this assemble the sweater, this part here, and then you are going to attach the right size sides, um, using the three needle bind off. So again, um, that's what it looks like up here. So when you are picking up stitches for, um, for the only stitches you're gonna pick up actually are just right under the arm here. So one per stripe again. And then um, the way that I did it, you're going to start picking up stitches at the bottom here. Um, and then you're going to knit all of these live stitches along the side. And then when you get to the underarm part, you're going to pick up one stitch per stripe in that there's a little short row section because this is this has a slight um, bit of ease and gusset there uh, just because it, it kind of is more like the human body. <laughs> so that little bit of extra room there helps kind of ease, um, you know, any sleeves you might be wearing underneath this and um, bodies don't have sharp angles. So I like to add just a little bit 
um, a little bit of curve in there. So once you finish getting all the stitches along this side, you are going to turn over and continue down the other side. So at this point, there are two separate pieces, but um, to keep from adding another bunch of um, tails, you're just going to grab the other piece and start down from the sleeve, getting all of your stitches worked all the way down. So once you're at the bottom again here, you'll have um, life stitches and you'll be doing a three needle bind off with them. So let me see, just want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions. Okay, so please feel free to ask anything, um, anything if you, yes, Nancy, you will totally be able to do it. So um, you will absolutely be able to do it. So one thing I, I'm going to do actually, I actually ordered a skein of um, Wild Bloom from Verb and um, I'm gonna be knitting along with you and I'm gonna do some videos with the steps. So if you're feeling uncomfortable about it, um, you'll, you'll uh, see, I'll, I will, I've got you covered, don't worry, um, it'll be fine. So, okay, so I do wanna say one thing. I know that there are a lot of patterns out there that look really simple because they don't have um, like a very in-depth explanation of exactly how to do each step or how to um, do transitions or you might see something that just says sew the sides together or attach front and back or something like that. So I, uh, when I write a pattern, I really want you to be able to have the result that I got. So I put a lot of effort into explaining exactly how I did everything so that you can actually do the exact steps that I did and get the result that I did. So I really think um, the devil is in the details. So every like every little geeky bit of, um, <laughs> of the pattern is explained. But just because there's more text, that doesn't make the pattern actually harder. It just makes it, means there's more explanation. So don't worry, um, anybody who's feeling like, oh no, um, you can do this. And when you get there, it really makes sense. So, um, you don't really have to remember like every little thing I said. When you get to that point, you'll just be like, oh, okay, I understand. It's it's okay. And we've got you. So um, so anyway, <laughs> I am I am actually gonna continue working on this this one uh, that I started with Bisha Bush. And then um, I I also wanted to try out the wild bloom because I haven't, um, I've never used that yarn before. So um, yeah, so I have this um, like really bright, beautiful, greeny color coming. Um, I think it was succulent and I'm going to pair it with some ETA I have. And um, I'll show you that in a minute. So don't worry, um, Nancy totally got you covered. Everybody have got you covered. Okay. So um, so this is, is basically, this is like the, that's the first page of the pattern. And in the pattern, you'll see um, that here's A, here's A. So I have this laid out so you can go to you can go take a look in the front here and see how it's coming together. Okay. So, um, yay, Claire, you are a sweetheart. <laughs> I I am a geek, I, I will admit. So, um, okay. I do wanna talk a little bit about the short rows used in here because I use several different techniques. So I use German short rows and 
wrap and turn. And that is because in the short row section, I believe those are the ones that look the best in this particular section here. So I know a lot of times that people are like, oh yeah, I'm gonna substitute. Um, it's not gonna look the same if you substitute in this particular case. And usually it's not that big a deal, but in this particular case, they will look different if you use a different method here. So let's see. So thank you, Terry. Yay. Okay, and then Nancy has a size question. Um, Nancy Porter has a size question. So I'm tinier at the shoulders than at the hips and frequently make two sizes. I've never done it sideways. Recommendations for size. Okay, so um, this is actually an A-line. So depending on... Uh, depending on how much difference there is, do you take a look at the schematic in the back here? So there is a difference between um, the bust up at the top here and the bottom down here. So I would go with the top part fit the way that you want the top part to fit. And probably um, the biggest thing here is going to be the sleeves recumbrance rather than the shoulder because the shoulder is continuous. So um, it's basically a drop shoulder. Um, so it shouldn't cause a problem for you. So um, measure the top of your back, see you know how much space you want up here and then measure, um, take a look at the circumference of the arm and, and see what you like there. And then, so um, if you take a look, A is, uh, there is five and a half inches difference um, across here that is not circumference wise. So basically the back is five and a half inches wider down at the base than it is up here because of their short rows. So it's um, it's very, very forgiving. So I think that you shouldn't have a problem with it. Um, just match your match the top of your body. And I think you'll be fine. So that does beg the question, how would you resize this? So if you want to make this longer, for instance, you're gonna to want to add stitches up above the short row section up here. And then you'll just be adjusting <clears throat> in this area here. Um, you'll be adjusting the number of stitches underneath the sleeves. So that would be on both sides. Okay. So, um, Let's take a look at the cast on. So I, as I was saying, um, it's Judy's magic cast on, and it's used as basically a provisional cast on. So a provisional cast on is when you want to have live stitches and work the other way. So I have a little yarn barf here. So let me get this. <clears throat> so weirdly enough, um, I noticed this when I started working with um, the Bisha Bush mohair. I am actually allergic to it. So I'm not sure if that's because of um, the sizing or milling or, or anything like that, but I, I am... Uh, I'm kind of sneezing a little bit and sniffly just having it right here. So if you are kind of allergic to one, you may not be allergic to another. That's my, that's my thing, but I do love fluff. So, um, yeah, so I just grin and bear it. <laughs> okay. So Judy's magic cast on is a two strand cast on. So that means kind of like the um, the um, 
the usual, God, I'm just having a senior moment here. Um, that means that you have to estimate how much tail you're going to use, kind of like the German twisted cast on or the long tail cast on. So I like to just wrap my needle um, 10 times and then ex extrapolate from there. So one, two, three. Okay, so <clears throat> I generally cast on and leave extra um, just because I hate running out of yarn. So I'm going to I'm going to leave that tail part in there too. So that was 10 um, 20 stitches. So I'm going to say here's 30 stitches. That's enough <clears throat> tail for 30 stitches. Okay, so to start this, I am going to loop this across the top needle here. Oh, and I should actually transition over here. So <clears throat> here are my needles. So for, um, for the actual sweater, I used two needles that were the same length. But yeah, so here are the needles. Okay. So I'm going to bring my, um, put my yarn across my top needle there. Then I'm going to hold my yarn. in a slingshot, just like I would with for a long tail. So that, that's my first stitch up there. So when I start to do this, I'm going always to use the yarn across my finger for the bottom needle and the yarn across my thumb for the top needle here. So since this is my very first stitch, now I'm going to put a stitch on that bottom needle. So the thing to remember is that you always want to get your stitches on there with the right leg in front and the left leg in back. And when you think about it that way, it's a lot easier to remember the motion of it. So that yarn is always going to come from below the needle and then around it. So that was my thumb to the top needle. And here is my finger to the bottom needle. So it's a little bit offset. Don't worry about that. I'm going to use my thumb here and it's going to come under that top needle and around and then my finger under the bottom needle and around. So thumb, finger, thumb, finger. And I also have this um, in a little teeny tiny tutorial. It's linked on the pattern page and in the pattern. So I have five here. I'm going to cast on a few more. Okay, let's see. Two, four, six, eight, ten. So I always put stitch markers in here after every 10 stitches. And one of the cool things about that is um, I never go back to and to work the other side and have and I, I always have the right amount of stitches when I go back on the other side to work it. So just always remember you're going to start with the top first and then the bottom. Top bottom. Top bottom. Okay. So let's take a look at the back here. I just cast on a random number of stitches. So here's the back and you can see that it has that pearl ridge there. So because the first row um, on the sweater 
is actually a, a different yarn. I'm going to tie a little knot, just a single knot in the back there to keep that from unraveling so that um, as I go along, these stitches aren't going to get all loose. And so you can see your, your ridge there, and this is going to be your right side. So to start working that, you're going to pull the bottom needle through so that the stitches are just going to sit on that cable across here. And then you're just going to be working these top stitches. So then Elise um, asked, when you do your short row, you bring yarn forward, slip stitch to right, then turn. I've seen it done both ways. Um, I don't actually think it makes that much of a difference. I think um, just your preference. So I will show you what I do. And um, yeah, your preference. I think they both look good. So I, I tend to like, I, I just give my stitch a hug basically. <laughs> okay. So I'm just gonna, I would just be starting a stripe of my next yarn there. So let me move this over. Um, and then I am going to show you um, my short row section here. So this is a random um, yarn here. So what I've done here, I, um, I've cast on all of my stitches. So these are the ones that are being held across the bottom here. So they're on my C1 yarn, which is my even tinier Annapurna. And then across the top here is my C2. And that one is my, um, my mohair silk. So let me just show you where I am. I am on row two right here. So I knit through the back loop two times and now I'm almost to the furthest marker, but I just wanted to show you where I'm going with this. So I'm going to knit to the farthest marker, slip the marker, knit one, and then turn. So let's get to my marker. Now I am going to slip it. So that's the farthest marker on the wrong side and I'm knitting one stitch here so hopefully you can see that if you can't let me know now I'm going to turn over okay at this point I'm on row three so I'm going to do a German short row so that is I'm going to slip that stitch with my yarn in front and then pull my working yarn over the top to make that double stitch and then slip my marker. Okay. So now I am going to go right on here. I'm going to knit two together and yarn over 10 times. So this is super fluffy. Sometimes I miss um, the actual stitch when I'm doing this. So I usually take this fairly slow so that I don't miss any stitches when I am uh, doing my knit two together. And this is going to take a little while, but I wanted to show you the entire length of this uh, because there's some some things at the end of the short row uh, when you're going back on the wrong side I wanted you to be able to see what exactly was going on so this is has my stitch markers all placed in there and um, just going along here 
So Joy says, are those your straw markers? Yes, they are. Um, so Joy was asking about my markers. I recycle plastic straws into stitch markers and they're super, super light. Um, so other things that work are those little pins that I was showing you at the top of um, each of my each of my decreases. Those are really super light as well. So the only thing about this type of stitch marker is that sometimes they migrate. So um, definitely keep an eye on the number of stitches in between. And if you come to a place where um, it doesn't look like things are correct, then make sure that you count the stitches in between the markers because um, they do migrate back and forth sometimes. So I was, again, like super explicit as to uh, the, <laughs> the short rows on this. So hopefully, um, hopefully you'll be able to figure out where you are. Okay, so I'm gonna get all the way to the end here. Um, the end of this, there's a knit. So I knit my edges through the back loop because that gives a, a nice edge to it. You can see like the stitches really scrunch up nicely on the needle there. Um, knitting through the back loop on the edge gives you a, a fairly finished edge so that you don't have to do anything special to it. I did actually, when I swatched, I did test to see what it would look like on the bottom with um, stitches picked up. And then I decided uh, that I didn't really like that. So it took away from the lightness of the sweater. Okay, so now I'm on row four. So I'm going to knit through the back loop twice and then purl to two stitches before the second farthest marker. Here's the farthest marker. Here's the second farthest marker. And you can see here how that uh, stitch marker is kind of migrating a little bit. So let's just make sure that everything is okay. I'm just gonna count as I go just to make sure um, that all the stitches are staying in the right place and behaving themselves because the yarn overs like to play. Okay. So there are 10 stitches here. And then there's 20 between each of the markers. So all the short row sections are the same for all the sizes. Um, if you decide to, if you really wanted to make it longer or something, I think I would add maybe to the bottom of it. So there's that little, that 10 stitches down there. I think um, if you wanted, if you wanted to make them a little bit longer, that would be the place to do it. Okay, so that one definitely migrated. So the short rows, um, the rest of it is, of course, garter, and the short row sections are largely stockinette stitch. So let's see if I have any other questions. Okay, no questions so far. Awesome. Okay, so I was going to two stitches be before that marker. Okay, so here I am. Um, I have worked two stitches before the second part of this marker. So the next stitch here is a yarn over that has not been worked into. So I am just going to wrap and turn the yarn over. And it's just like any other stitch. So I had my needle, my yarn was in front to purl and I just slipped that yarn over 
Then I'm gonna bring my yarn to the back, slip the yarn over back onto my left needle and then turn. And so my yarn is gonna go to the back here. So you can see um, when you wrap a yarn over, you still preserve the yarn over. So it's almost like you just have like a little tiny stitch sticking out the top of it there, but the yarn over still looks like a yarn over and it's meant to. So that is correct. If that's what you're getting, that is correct. So now we're on row five here. So the markers are going to move on row five and that is written in here. So I'm going to knit one stitch here and then I'm going to knit two together. Okay, and then this first one here, I'm gonna yarn over and knit two together eight times. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you can see here, I can't get my eighth one. That's because that stitch marker needs to move. So it's gonna move one stitch to the left. I'm just gonna work around it and then move it. So it's moved one stitch to the left to get that last knit two together in there. And now I'm going to do 10 times in this next section. And the same thing's gonna happen. Um, when one marker moves, they move all the way across. And this is part of keeping the correct number of stitches. So the other, the mirror of this is very similar, um, but it, there's a little bit of a difference in there too. So. so again, here's that last one. I just usually knit around it. I knit two together around it. Oops, and there we go. And then at the end here, I am up here now. So I'm gonna yarn over and then knit two together three times. So there was one, two, and three. And then I'm left with these three stitches here. So I am going to yarn over and then knit these three through the back loop. And you can see now um, you're starting to get that patterning. And I'm gonna turn over. Um, I am on row six, so I'm going to purl to the second marker. And that is this marker right here. Um, I'm gonna knit two stitches through the back loop and then purl to the second marker. And I'm just kind of keeping track to make sure that my yarn overs are staying in the right place. I realize watching me knit is like watching paint dry, but, <laughs> but I really wanted you all to see the short row section worked completely um, because I, I don't want anyone to be scared of it. It's, you can all totally do this. Okay, so I knit to, uh, sorry, I purled to my second marker. I'm gonna slip my marker and purl one. And then I'm going to wrap this yarn over and turn again. So same thing I did before. So I like to preserve how that yarn over looks and that's gonna help me preserve how it looks. And then I am 
right here on um, row seven. So I'm going to knit one and slip my marker, knit two together, yarn over 10 times. So this is, this is the only part of the sweater where um, I feel like having lots of distractions is a bad thing. The rest of it is really like super easy to remember. Once you're past this, it's just like nothing. As long as you mark all of your decreases, you will not have any problems at all. Okay, then going to knit two together yarn over four times and I'm I will get I see that there's a question um, I will answer in just a moment but I just want to make sure that I don't get lost in the middle of this because like I was saying <laughs> having distractions during this particular piece of it can be kind of a, a little bit of a pain okay so I was just finishing row seven, and now I'm going to do row eight. And then I will show you how to basically resolve this, the, everything, all the, all the yarn overs and um, all the, the uh, short rows and everything. So I'm on row eight. So I knit one through the back loop two times, and then I'm going to purl six. Two, three, four, five, six. And now I'm going to wrap my next yarn over again and turn. So these wrapped yarn overs, the wraps are all going to stay there. You don't have to do anything special to them. When you work across there, you just leave them. So now I am on row nine. So I'm going to knit one, yarn over, and then knit two together, yarn over two times. And these last three stitches are worked through the back loop. Okay, just gonna take a break to answer a question. So, Okay, you all are so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad that this. Um, I'm glad that this is helping. Actually, okay. So here I am. Um, I am on row ten. So row ten is is a long row. That is where they're going to be worked all the way across. So I kind of like to leave stuff, um, leave something there and work through it to make sure that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be because, you know, stuff happens. I lose my train of thought. Um, I'm live. So I'm <laughs> like thinking about you all, not thinking about my knitting. Okay, so as you can see, you're going to leave your wraps in place. And this is going to be knit across. So on this first side, uh, you see that there's that garter ridge. So this is the garter ridge that's going to be on the other side. So I am going to knit two stitches through the back loop and then knit six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so now we're right here. I'm going to knit two together. So you can see they're sort of together here and they, they don't look very good together like that. So I'm gonna knit two together. And now I'm gonna take this bar in between stitches here and lift it onto the needle. And that is right here, place on left needle. And now I am going to knit two together and slip my marker. 
So two, four, six, eight, ten stitches. So that's how you can tell if you're correct. You'll have ten on the on the bottom part here, and then twenty in between the markers. Okay, so here we are. So I've knit two together and then slipped the marker. And now I'm going to knit 20. And that's just the stitches in between these markers. So the this row here uh, smooths out the um, short rows. And the, the other thing it does is it helps you retain the correct number of stitches. So I did not want to make it very, I didn't want to make it too confusing on the other side by um, going like straying way off of stitch counts on the right side. Okay, so I knitted 20 and I slipped my marker. So now I'm going to lift the bar before my next stitch and place it on my left needle. So here is that bar right here in between the stitches. And that is going to be, I'm going to knit three together. So you can see it leaves what looks like a yarn over there. So that's right where I am right here. I did the knit three together. Now I'm going to lift another bar and place it on my left needle. So you can see that there's an obvious sort of hole there. I'm going to place that up on my left needle and then knit 16. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Now I'm gonna lift another bar before my next stitch right here and place it up on my left needle and knit three together. So be careful when you knit three together that you get your needle through all of the stitches. It's super easy to grab fluff instead. And now I'm going to lift my barb in front of the next stitch and place it up on my left needle and knit two stitches and slip my marker. So I'm right here, I'm gonna knit 20. So that is just all the stitches in between those two markers. And at this point, we're kind of home free. So as you're going across um, and you're lifting those bars, mostly it's gonna be really super obvious where you wanna lift it because it's going to look like there should be a yarn over there. So this was mostly because um, in order to keep the stitch count even, I had to do a little bit of uh, shenanigans with the short rows. Okay, so now I'm back right here. I have that double stitch for my German short row and I am going to knit that as one stitch. And now I can work to the end. So um, we are running late on time today, so I'm not going to do the other short row section, but it is very, very similar. Um, and I will actually, as soon as I get that wild bloom, the skein of wild bloom, I will actually um, document the process. So if you are um, having any particular problems with anything, um, let me know. And I will, I'll make a little video and show you what it looks like. Okay, so that is the first short row section done. And there's going to be one more of these. And then you're gonna be doing the second short row section, which is um, a mirror image of it. But because the, the um, 
because of the mirroring and slanting the other way, it's slightly different. And um, it's, it's uh, very similar, but slightly different. Okay, so let me transition back here to my face. Okay, so like I was saying before, I am going to be, um, I'll document my process and everything because I really do want you to get the same result that I get. So um, like that's, that's really important to me. So I don't like to, um, put in patterns, you know, just sew something together or just do this or that. And um, I want you to know exactly what I did so that you can do it too, or you can decide not to. It's your sweater. You get to, you get to do what you want to do. Um, if you want to sew things up instead, totally, it's totally your thing. But if you want it to look like mine, I want you to be able to get there completely. Um, okay, so let's see if any other questions. I'm so glad you like it, Claire. Um, it is a really super light, fluffy sweater. Um, and it's like a soft little light hug when you wear it. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I am going to be teaching, by the way, this doesn't have anything to do with the sweater, but I am going to be teaching for Vogue Knitting Online in um, late April, uh, 1920 and 21. And then I will also be teaching in Philadelphia over Memorial Day weekend for Melissa Leitman. Um, and then there's, there is going to be a Camp Knitaway in September, and it's um, like a private island in Connecticut. So it's, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's like a little camp. We take over the entire island. Um, it's, so the, it's Row House Yarns that runs it. And she is going to hire a pri private chef and we are gonna have so much fun. So um, that is coming up soon. You'll be able to sign up for it if you would like to come and hang out on an island in Connecticut, like an, a little private island. <laughs> anyway, let me see if there are any more questions. Okay. Okay. Yay. I am so glad, Mary, that I give you confidence. Yay. So hopefully um, the, the videos as we go along too will help as well. And also, please feel free to ask me um, to show anything in particular. I'm happy to make little tiny videos in the interim and um, post them here or reels on Instagram or anything like that. Um, but I will, like I said, I'll, I will be documenting steps um, as I go along so that um, you can just see like the whole thing from start to finish. And um, yeah, so I and I have two of them that I'm doing in my spare time. Haha. <laughs> anyway, so thank you so much for joining me. Um, yes, Elise, you will totally be able to knit this. So the only, um, the only part that's like the least bit challenging is the short row part. And after that, it's really, it's simple really i swear it really is even the picking up stitches part because you're just picking up right at the top of each stripe so there's no guesswork like you don't have to guess about where you're going to pick up the stitches at all it's obvious so um like it's yeah you'll totally be able to do it so anyway so let's see if there are other questions Yes. So um, I did, like Sue reminded me, I did actually, I have a list of little technique videos um, and those are, they're linked in the pattern. And then they're also linked on the pattern pages on both my site and on Ravelry. So um, let me know if there's other stuff that you would like to see too. So um, in the short videos, there's Judy's Magic Cast On um, to start. 
I think the only thing that I didn't really cover in the short videos was picking up the stitches um, from the top, but I will make, I will make a video on that. And um, I think that's basically the only thing that I didn't really cover. And then a wrap and turn on a yarn over, but now you have that. So yeah, so thank you so much. Yay, and don't be a stranger. Like ask me if there's anything you, you wanna know um, and I'm happy to oblige. So thank you, thank you for joining me. And um, I will be live next week too. So um, between now and then, if there's something else you'd like to, me to go over, I will absolutely do that. So take good care and um, have a great weekend, everybody. Bye-bye, and I'll see you soon.